right, here we go. All right, well, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the webinar entitled Home Improvements for the Elderly. My name is Matt Parker. I'm with the law firm of Marshall, Parker & Weber. Uh, today we're going to be talking about making home improvements uh, so that you can age in place. Uh, the more than 20 years that I've been practicing elder law, I've seen a real shift in how my clients receive long-term care services. So many more of them today are staying at home much longer than they ever did before. As a consequence, many of them need to modify their home as they develop various physical challenges. So today, we're going to be talking about changes to the home, including the bathroom, stair glides, if you have more than one floor, maybe other modifications that you need so you can stay at home rather than relocate. Uh, to help me with the home improvement discussion, I've invited someone to help co-present who knows a lot about the modifications of homes to assist the elderly and other individuals with disabilities. So, Art Thomas is uh, with Diversified Construction in Sealands Grove, Pennsylvania. Art, uh, perhaps you can tell me a little bit about yourself and your company, Diversified Construction. Hello. I'm a professional engineer, a Penn State graduate. I've been uh, in the engineering profession for more than 30 years. Uh, we have two companies. I own two companies. One is MechTech Incorporated. They're civil engineers and professional land surveyors. And for 20 years now, we've had a little general construction company called Diversified Construction. We've been doing home modification construction since 2006. And I estimate that we've done more than 200 home modification projects in the last 15 years. And I, I think your, your son is what uh, is called a certified aging in place specialist. Uh, perhaps you can tell me a little bit about that certification. That's correct. Sam Thomas is now one of the select group of professionals nationwide to earn the certified aging in place specialist or CAPS designation. Identifying him as a designer with the skills and knowledge necessary to remodel or modify a home to meet the unique needs of the older population, disabled owners, or their visitors. The CAPS program includes training and education on the technical, business management, and customer service skills essential to compete in the fastest growing segment of the residential remodeling industry, home modifications for aging in place. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this movement called Aging in Place. Uh, it is directed at seniors who want to ensure that they can live in their home, in their community, safely, independently, and comfortably, regardless of their age, income, or ability level. So to accomplish this goal, seniors need help to stay independent and maintain their quality of life. Some of the topics that this movement focuses on include your personal health, your finances, as well as the home environment. So aging in place will require home modification, modifications and often some structural changes. Uh, in order to stay at home as long as possible, you need to investigate what changes need to be made to your home, the cost of those changes, and who is available to make them. Now there are various resources out there to try and evaluate those needed changes to your home. Uh, there are, for example, geriatric care managers. And there are also occupational specialists who can recognize the changes to modify your home so you can age in place. Now, from the construction standpoint, Art, why don't you tell me a little bit about the initial considerations you get into in meeting with a client to talk about these home modifications? The first and possibly most important step is to assess the consumer's needs. That's not just for today, but also for tomorrow. Uh, quite often, unfortunately, um, some people wait until there's been an accident, and then you're behind the eight ball and you've got some catching up to do in order to get your home modified. But once you've assessed the consumer's need, whether it's weakness on the right side of the body or uh, bone spurs that make it uh, difficult to walk up steps, then you can determine what modifications you can make to the home. And the first thing you do is draw an existing floor plan of areas that will need to be modified and also 
draw a proposed floor plan that reflects the changes that you want to make. It's important to have a real physical plan that you can lay on the table. Once you've gotten your plan, write your scope of work. You can have a contractor help you with all of these tasks I'm talking about, but you must develop a written scope of work. After you know your scope of work, determine what permits are required. Anything you do outside will require a zoning permit if your municipality has zoning. Ramps could need a building permit. If a ramp is going to be more than 30 inches above ground, you will need a building permit to confirm adequacy of the foundation for the posts associated with the ramp. Building permits can be required for general construction, electrical, mechanical, and plumbing. Some municipalities, if you say I'm going to take a tub out of the bathroom and put a shower in, pull a vanity out and put a wall-mounted sink in, they'll tell you, oh, no permit required, go do it. Other municipalities will require you to have a master plumber and a plumbing permit, an, electri an electrical permit and a master electrician, and a general construction permit to do that work. Every municipality has unique ways of interpreting the building code and building permit laws. So you have to know what permits are going to be required and how much they will cost. In addition to the cost of the permits, which some might think are trivial, but nevertheless are a real part of the project, you need to develop a cost estimate. Now, if you're savvy enough, you might be able to do that yourself, or you may need your contractor to give you an estimate of costs so you know what you can plan for. And lastly, please make sure you realize how long things will take. Remember, contractors are busy, especially the good ones. If you've got somebody that shows up within an hour, odds are they may not be quite as good as they profess to be, unless they've got somebody that's really a Johnny on the spot. But contractors are busy. It's going to take some time to get to them. It might take six to nine months from the time a contractor shows up to assist you with your needs and what's needed to be done until you have construction completion. And it can be 12 to 24 months if you're looking to put a building addition onto your home. All right, so that's a lot of work to do before you even get to any of the improvements. Uh, so let's start at this point just talking a little bit about some of the common home modifications. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with the external improvements to the home. So, uh, Art, what are some of the changes that you're commonly requested to make uh, externally that are going to help an adult stay in the home? The first thing we look at when we arrive at someone's home is their external access to the home from outside. As simple as can they get in and out of their automobile? If they don't have a garage, where is the car commonly parked? If a wheelchair is what we're talking about, is there room to get out of the car, onto the wheelchair, and wheel to the house? If there is a garage and you're in a wheelchair, how are you going to get from the garage up the several steps into the home? Have to look at that accessibility. Do you need an outside, outside stair glide to get up an outside set of steps? And remember, whenever a stair glide is discussed, whether it be inside or out, you have to be thinking about the transferability. You're going to need two wheelchairs, one at the bottom of the stair glide and one at the top to take off with later. And if you don't have room for a ramp outside, if you're in town, smaller lots, near the street and sidewalk, you might need what's called a vertical platform lift or BPL. It's basically a small personal residential elevator to get you from the uh, sidewalk up to the porch. Are there sidewalks at the site? And if so, what condition are they in? And are they wide enough? You know, if you've got a wheelchair or a walker, you're going to need three to four feet of width. And it can't be slate sidewalk that's heaved from frost over the years. You're going to need a sidewalk in good condition. And don't forget about that door threshold from the porch into the house. Everybody opens their front door, walks into the house, and never thinks about the fact that it's a seven to eight inch step up from the porch into the house. You could spend seven or $10,000 building a ramp to your porch 
only to still have another step to get into the house. You have to be thinking about these things and make sure the porch elevation gets adjusted also. How about that front door? Is the width adequate? Is there a screen door? And do the doors swing the right way? You know, screen doors can pull off from right to left. The door to the house can go from left to right. And once again, when you're not incapacitated, it's not a problem. But if you're wheeling up in a chair, you have to be accessible to these doors. All right. Well, I think our next slide has a picture of a ramp. Uh, it's a rather typical home modification, one that I run into a lot with my clients. They're always talking about installing ramps in their homes, uh, particularly for the elderly, whether they have a wheelchair or walkers. Um, so any do's and don'ts with this ramp installation, we have a before and after picture right here uh, with the ramps. Uh, I bet you you've got to analyze if you know the, the grade you have with these ramps and whether you've got enough room to put it in, because some ramps you know, snake around in different ways in order to get into the house. That's correct. I would say looking at this slide, the first don't is uh, don't pile garbage in your front yard, folks. That's not really a good habit, especially if there's zoning. The zoning officer might get after you. But nevertheless, uh, if you take a look at the after ramp, one of the things you do need to do is do make sure you have permits. Again, uh, if you're doing this outside, obviously to get to the front porch, you want to make sure you've obtained a zoning permit with respect to building setbacks if your municipality has zoning. Do decide the type of ramp you want. As you can see in this picture, it's a pressure-treated wooden ramp with posts that are uh, founded on uh, concrete holes down into the ground. Uh, some people are very concerned about how the ramp needs to fit in with the rest of the appearance of their house. So you could build a pressure-treated ramp, which is typically the most economical. There's also portable aluminum ramps, which I'm sure many of you have seen around town that can be purchased and put in place. And of course, there's a block and concrete, like a block foundation on your basement walls in your house and poured concrete slab on top. The railings you see in the picture are pressure treated. You can also have vinyl or painted wood, just like the one in the existing condition on the left. These people may have asked to have the railings painted to match their front porch, but they didn't, and we're okay with it. Um, do build your ramp wide enough, uh, you, especially if you're going to need a turn back. If there's going to be a twist in your ramp, you need a five foot by five foot square landing pad to be able to, to make that turn properly. So you want to make sure you've got a wide enough ramp. There's graspable hand railings that sometimes are required if your slope is a little bit steeper than it ought to be to make it fit on the property. And once again, don't forget that front porch door threshold. You can see that wonderful ramp on the right side and you can wheel up when that porch isn't raised. You still have to make that step into the house and it's as though you spent that money for nothing. Great, all right. Next picture, the next one, is uh, something you mentioned in your presentation, the vertical platform lifts, which I have not seen as many of, uh, but it was curious to me that these are often practical in cases where uh, you just don't have the ability to build a ramp. And so this is an example of a, a house which obviously you needed access to the second floor from one floor to another, and, and given the amount of space you have, you couldn't put a ramp in there, so the VPL or vertical platform lift is what you used. That's correct. This is a, a home built literally on a mountain. This is a, um, a, a high-scale development outside of Danville, Pennsylvania, and most of the homes are built somehow on a sloping part of the mountain. And the individual was rehabilitating in a facility and wanted to come home. And in order to come home, they were going to need to have their home made accessible. Uh, the individual that owned the property was very concerned about the aesthetics and how the home was going to be altered and required us to provide access from the first floor or ground floor level outside up to the second floor versus going in through the garage or another entrance. So this was personal choice at this point but many times we turn to vertical platform lifts when there's not enough room for a ramp. Uh, 
in town especially, you'll have five, six, maybe even seven steps from the sidewalk up to the porch. And ramps can be no steeper than one inch, one inch rise per foot of run, an inch per foot. So if you have 40 inches of steps from the ground to the porch, you're going to need 40 feet length of ramp. And some places just don't have that room. And if you've got to overcome that height, we'll turn to a vertical platform lift. You can see the picture on the right side of the slide is a blow up close up of the picture on the left side. And we also installed the railing in the foreground of the left side of the picture as a safety measure because of the drop off on the side of the hill there. And there was sidewalk that we needed to install. To the left of the left picture, you can't see it, but we poured a widened slab in the driveway so that the consumer could get out of their uh, accessible van onto that new slab, onto the new sidewalk we put in place, uh, safe by the railing we installed, onto that vertical platform lift that took them up to their deck and through their patio doors into the main living space of their house. That's great. That's impressive. Okay. So let's go on to the next area of discussion. And so we're going from the exterior of the house to the interior. Here we're talking about the access in and around the house. Once you get through the front door, and let's say you are in a wheelchair or perhaps a walker, you know, what are some of the issues uh, that we're going to run into in making this house more livable? Uh, we're going to talk separately about the bathroom changes, but let's initially talk about some of the basic changes you'll have to make maybe to the floors and uh, the various doorways. So, Art, do you want to take it? Uh, sure. Uh, and I want to remind everybody, uh, don't let this be overwhelming for you. There are people out there today that can help you. As we mentioned before in our shop, we have a CAPS certified aging in place specialist that can come out and meet with you and help you through uh, what adjustments may or may not be needed to the home based on budgetary constraints that you might have. There's also occupational therapists and physical therapists out there that can help you. In light of that, uh, one of the first things we need to look at is as simple as, a, is there a change of floor covering needed? Do we need to get rid of the old 1970s shag carpet and get some laminate flooring in there for ease of maneuvering in the home? <clears throat> Are there any interior door widenings required? You know, so often homes were built with 28 or 30 inch wide doorways into bedrooms and bathrooms and kitchens and studies. And with wheelchair access, you're gonna need a full 36 inch wide doorway if at all possible. Now, sometimes when we do mods, we can get away with 32 inch wide doors into bathrooms because it's all we have to work with. But people have to be a little bit more careful. Standard wheelchairs are 26 to 28 inches wide. So a 30 inch wide doorway doesn't leave too much room for error. Whereas a 36 inch wide is a standard width opening for accessibility uh, commercially in the United States and also residentially wherever you can get it. So doorways may need to be widened and even sometimes hallways need to be widened, but you do have to be careful that you're not taking out load bearing walls that are supporting the second floor or the roof of a home. And you may need a stair glide or even a personal elevator to travel between floors. Obviously, uh, the scale of changes that might be needed can be as simple from, as adding a few grab bars throughout the house Two, installing a personal elevator, which involves floor cutting and bracing and, and the installation of the device itself. So there's budgetary constraints and there's also physical constraints. All right, so here is an example of a stair glide. Um, these seem like rather steep steps to me as I look down from the, the top of the stairs to the bottom. Uh, and I've been amazed sometimes as I go out and visit my clients in some of these older homes, how steep their steps are and uh, how challenging it must be as they get older to get up and down those. And so the stair glide is a, obviously a practical way to get from the top to the bottom as their, their ability to stay mobile starts to fade. So uh, any, any comments about the stair glide installation you wanna provide here, Art? Sure, um, steepness typically is not a problem for us, uh, we've not, uh, come across a steep stairwell that we couldn't accommodate. What we more often run into is whether or not that stairwell is wide enough to accommodate 
the chair and the rail and provide clearance between the back of the chair and the wall so that the device can function properly. Uh, fortunately, in a residential setting, uh, you can uh, get away with, we'll say, uh, restricting the narrowness of those steps as long as you can get that chair to go up and down. And as you look at that picture on the right, you might think, well, that's not such a big deal, and that's absolutely right. But that picture you're looking at does not have a person sitting in the chair with their knees sticking out. And sometimes what we run into is that distance from the back of the chair to the front of the kneecap and whether or not that can clear going up stairwells. Sometimes we have multiple uh, landings and we have to put a curved stair glide in. Again, the most restrictive thing we'll run into is whether or not there's enough width. In a commercial setting, which this seminar is not about, you have to worry about fire escape and uh, people from a commercial business or a church or an institution of some type getting out in case of a fire. And we have to have enough width in a stairwell for the chair plus escape maneuvering. In a residential setting, you don't have that. So stair glides can really help people, especially in what I'll call a standard home where the living and recreational areas are downstairs and the uh, sleeping and bathing quarters are all upstairs. Uh, the glide can get you from floor to floor so that you can still uh, be throughout the entire house. Great. Okay. So this might be the, uh, the biggest area of modification in a residential home, uh, that is the bathroom. Lots of issues here, uh, including changes to the toilet uh, as well as the shower. Uh, sadly, as an elder law attorney, I know from talking to families, this is the area where so many slip and falls occur with our older adults. Uh, so, Art, what are some of the considerations here when making modifications to the bathroom? Uh, I'll tell you, one of the biggest things is the toilet height. Um, you know, people, we, we all sit on a low toilet. Why do we sit on low toilets? Think about it while I'm talking to you, your toilet's low. Well, they make comfort height or chair height toilets. And as people age, it can be difficult to get up and away from those low toilets that once again, we take for granted on a daily basis. So it might be uh, as simple as switching out a toilet to a comfort height one. Uh, how about that tub? Uh, you might have to change out your tub and put in a barrier free or beach entry shower. A barrier-free shower still has a lip on it. It meets accessibility requirements, but it still has a lip. And sometimes we've run into situations where we've provided a barrier-free shower. Folks thought they knew what they were getting, but maybe we have an 86-year-old man that's being wheeled in and out of the shower by his 88-year-old wife, and she just can't get over that one to one and a half inch lip with collapsible rubber water dam with that wheelchair and wants to know why she spent all that money. And if that's the case, we may need to go to a beach entry, which is a zero entry, where we'll actually shave the floor joists so that we can create a sloped uh, basin in the shower and that you can wheel directly from the shower or from the bathroom floor into the shower. So it's important to the consumer knows whether they're getting barrier free or beach entry or just exactly what they're getting. Sometimes we can put a tile in the bathroom and make it a tile shower, or we have what we call an outro flooring, which is more like an institutional epoxy product. Like you might uh, recognize by taking your animal to the veterinarian and going in the little exam room and those floors are kind of moppable and scrubbable from wall to wall. We can put a floor like that in bathrooms too if there's a situation where there's frequent messes that need to be cleaned up. Accessible sink that a wheelchair can wheel under. We all have that bathroom with the vanity sink that came with the house. We'll take the vanity sink out and we'll put a wall mountable sink in so that the wheelchair can get in underneath. <clears throat> is the bathroom big enough to maneuver? Quite often it's not. It's typically as wide as the bathtub that it was put in, and you have to walk past the sink, <clears throat> excuse me, and the toilet to get to the shower. <clears throat> so there are often times, if it's on the second floor, and there's three bedrooms, the kids are grown up, they've moved out of the house, the bedrooms aren't being used anymore, we can move. We can uh, tear down one of the bathroom walls and bump it into the bedroom a little bit more. 
still the bed the bedroom can re maintain its functionality, but it can give you that additional two or three feet of width in a bathroom for maneuverability. <clears throat> How about electrical? You can't forget about that. Anytime you do an improvement, maybe you put a GFI, ground fault intercept uh, outlet in your bathroom, you might have to add a circuit to your circuit breaker box in the basement. And if your circuit breaker box is full, that can present a problem too. And don't forget about the plumbing. What floor are you working on? <clears throat> you can't just pick up a toilet and move it on the second floor of a house. The toilet plumbing is so much larger than the other plumbing in the house. And you could be going through floor joists <clears throat> that the property is not prepared to handle. So you have to think about all these things when you're looking in a bathroom model. <clears throat> and there's a picture of the classic modifications there. You can see the older style toilet, the ceramic toilet, and uh, you took that out and put in a what looks like the walk-in shower there, and then the toilet with the grab bars uh, right next to it. Um, so that's sort of a classic uh, style modification that people ask for. Yeah, take note that those uh, grab bars are adjustable. <clears throat> Some people call them slip-ups. I like to call them drop-downs. So you can move them up parallel with the wall to get out of the way so that you can get in and out of the toilet. <clears throat> And lastly, uh, the, la the kitchen. Um, I suspect like the rest of the home, the these sorts of changes need to be made to allow a, an adult, an uh, older adult, maybe to use the kitchen and appliance as they get older and perhaps somebody who might be in a wheelchair. Um, so some comments about the classic modifications in the kitchen. Probably the biggest thing is just maneuverability in the kitchen. <clears throat> Quite often kitchens are just not provided with space. <clears throat> Excuse me for a wheelchair to get around an island and get to the countertops. So you have to make sure that you've got the maneuverability and that could be the replacement of an island. <clears throat> Often when people want to maintain their independence, they'll have to provide a lower island. Uh, but while they're in the wheelchair, they can still have a, a sink to wash lettuce or cut fruit if that's what they want to do and still be able to have a staging area to prepare the food for the kitchen. So we'll quite often take an island out <clears throat> and specially design and install an island to, feet, to fit the maneuverability needs of the consumer. Uh, also, some people don't realize there are accessible appliances. <clears throat> and typically what makes an appliance accessible is having the controls for the appliance right out on the front face where it's easy to get to. There are also down rotational cabinets for those upper cabinets. As if we don't all have enough trouble getting into the upper cabinets as it is, if you're in a wheelchair, they simply become prohibitive. But there are uh, manufacturers that will make cabinets that either manually or with the motorized units can have those cabinets rotate down for your use and access and then rotate back up. All right, very good. <clears throat> all right, so last thing I'm gonna ask you about, Art, uh, is, when some modifications might not be advisable, and I, I asked this question because I'd once talked to a realtor who, you know, he and I were discussing about these changes uh, we sometimes are seeing seniors make to their home, and he was talking about the resale value. Because obviously these seniors aren't going to live in the home for the rest of their lives. Likely they'll be selling them, perhaps after they passed away. And some of the things we talked about today clearly can be put back the way they were. So for a young family moving in, they can replace the, the toilet and uh, maybe the ramp can be removed. if It's a removable type of, of item uh, that can be taken away from the house. Uh, but certainly when the kids or the next generation go to sell it, they're going to have to take these issues into consideration. So I suspect there's sort of an area where, hey, before we make this change, you want to think about what this might do to the resale value. Yes, I would say that... Uh that's got to be one of the things that are discussed at that initial consultation uh, is the owner's concern for the resale of the house with the adjustments that are potentially going to be made. Is it important to them and their family uh, that these things be considered temporary for removal afterwards? Or they don't care about that at all. We want what's best for mom and dad, and whenever it's over, we'll deal with what's next. So that's a decision that everyone needs to, to make. Mm -hmm. But some recommendations I would make are don't eliminate a bedroom. 
uh, we'll go into a bedroom to make a bathroom larger, but I wouldn't recommend eliminating a bedroom. That can be detrimental on the resale. And I would consider a ramp construction, however permanent looking, that it could be temporary if the next owner wants it to be so. Uh, as far as bathroom modifications, other than the grab bars, uh, a bathroom modification could also be considered an upgrade. Those of us like me, if you're like me, you have a tub shower. I've lived in my house for over 20 years now, and I think the day we moved into that house 20 years ago, I took a tub bath, and I don't think I've had one ever since. So the fact that that tub shower might need to be replaced by an accessible shower could actually be a benefit to the home. Uh, a lot of times anymore today, people will have a sauna room where they can go sit in a whirlpool tub separate from the standard bathroom that they use anyway. So, and grab bars themselves aren't a bad idea. If you look at the, uh, the picture we showed you previously, the shower grab bars, it's a standard item whether you're 80 or eight years old. Uh, the flip up grab bars, they're bolted to either the wall or the floor and can be easily patched over if someone wants to have them removed. So most adjustments we're talking about, wide doorways, wide hallways, I don't think are going to be detrimental to the home. Uh, it would just be aesthetics and uh, with a ramp type scenario. And it's a matter of whether or not you're okay with that temporarily and understanding that it can be temporary in nature. There'll be a cost to remove, but uh, it's something to consider. It's a matter of who it's important to. All right, very good. All right, so I'm going to make just some final comments about the sources of payment uh, for these home modifications that we've talked about. Obviously, you can pay privately for them, uh, like you would for any home improvements. You might be able to get a home equity line of credit uh, to pay for them and so on. Uh, however, there are some programs out there to assist those with lower income and limited resources uh, to help pay for the changes to their home. Uh, I'm obviously going to focus on the elderly, although I know that ART deals with people of all ages who have disabilities. So um, he's exposed to a lot of organizations that help people uh, many people make these changes whether they're older or not. Uh, here's the primary source of payment for these services. Uh, There's a government program called Medical Assistance. Uh, the federal government calls it Medicaid. And for home and community-based services, uh, the program affecting our older adults, and quite frankly, most adults nowadays, is called the Community Health Choices Waiver Program. Uh, formerly, there was a so-called waiver program specifically tail tailored to those people over age 60 and you would uh, go to the area agency on aging to apply for it. It was called the Aging Waiver Program. But beginning January 1st of this year, it was combined with several other waiver programs uh, that serve our community into one program now commonly known as the CHC Waiver Program. Now, the program is administered by one of three managed care uh, programs in our region or in your region of the state. Uh, you would initially make application for the program through what's called an independent enrollment broker. I have the number on this slide. Uh, so if you're interested in applying for a waiver program, this is the number you will be calling. Uh, what will happen is that the broker will come out and evaluate your need for the services and then arrange for a medical review by a representative from the area agency on aging. If of course you're an older adult. Uh, once determined to be in need of these services, including any of the home modifications, uh, there's going to be a determination of your financial eligibility. So they're going to take a look at your income and resources. I'm not going to go over those limitations now, but I can tell you that not everybody's going to be eligible for the Medicaid waiver programs. Uh, if you have excess resources but very low income, you may be able to become eligible for the waiver program with some financial planning. Uh, I'd recommend you go to an elder law attorney, such as Marshall Parker and Weber, and uh, make an appointment to learn if you can become eligible through some planning. Now, there are other programs out there for our senior uh, clients. Uh, one of them is called the Options Program. Uh, it's available to the seniors through the Area Agency on Aging. Um, it is funded separately from the Medicaid program. So if you're not eligible for the waiver program, there may be eligibility for you through this Options Program. However, keep in mind your income comes into play when you apply for these benefits. If you have higher income, you end up paying a little bit more for the services than lower income candidates. I'd recommend you see the Department of Aging's website for more information. And lastly, those seniors who are veterans may want to visit their local VA office and determine if they are eligible for assistance. 
There are grants available through the VA as well as other nonprofit organizations that do help our veterans. Some of the benefits are tied to whether the veteran was disabled um, due to the military service versus simply being older and developing the various issues as they age. Uh, there is a pension program called Aid in Attendance that helps defray the cost of the unreimbursed medical expenses, such as those medically necessary home modifications. Uh, there are financial eligibility rules in terms of service for this Aid in Attendance program, so do visit Nelder Law Attorney or your local county VA representative to see if you are eligible. And while it's perhaps beyond the scope of our elderly clients, there are some other sources of assistance, particularly for the disabled. I know ART deals with a lot of these organizations, and one of them is the Centers for Independent Living. They have a home modifications and access program. I don't deal with them regularly, but ART, uh, they do, help, do help uh, many of your clients who are Medicaid eligible acquire those modifications, don't they? That's correct. Okay, great. Uh, so I should point out that there are some other um, low income benefits for those individuals who are disabled. There are some mortgage and grant programs out there. One of them is the Access Home Modification Program via the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, often abbreviated as PHFA. And it's a deferred payment loan with no interest and no monthly payments payable only when the home is sold. There are lots of these out there for low-income individuals, whether you're disabled or not. So I'd encourage you to visit that website, the PHFA website, to learn more about low-income loans. And all right, that's going to do it for our presentation. So please don't hesitate to reach out to Art at Diversified Construction and Seelands Grove. I really appreciate him joining me today to present this information. Uh, you can also contact Marshall Parker and Weber for more information. Thank you.